Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. I'm your host, Alex Gore. I'm here with the one and only Lance Psycho, everyone. Lance Psycho. Profes- always- professional fisherman. Yeah. Part time architect. I always appreciate a good intro, good claps. I don't think it's done enough. I agree. It's uh, almost as solid as uh, free high fives, fist bumps, fing- you know, finger guns. finger guns at the AIA. So yep. stop by the Art Cab booth. You get all of those. Yep. You do free. it to us, you'll get it back twice 100%. as much. So yeah. uh, I will do. I will do a double fist bump. I will do a double handshake. I will do a special handshake. Can you even? I, if someone comes out with two hands, I will go over. Yep. That's the way to do it's it. It's no problem. It's no problem. One of you. Yep. One of you, please. Yep. Do it. Lance looks like that. I look like this. There you go. Speaking of being cool, Rabbit Rocket Ship is cool. <laughs> 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 because Rocket Ships are cool. That's what I hear. <laughs> they go up. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes they blow up. Sometimes they blow up. So they do two things that are awesome. This will not do either one of those. Okay. Except it will up your skills at yeah. Revit. Because we have trained, uh, by this point, hundreds of professionals. Hundreds? Wow, Al. Well, that's quite the accomplishment. I'm, I'm serious. Thousands I of believe students. You. I believe you, yeah. Now those students, a lot of them are professionals. So maybe thousands of professionals. Mm-hmm. Our own staff. So you get the inside view of an actual architecture firm, how you train to be competent, to be professional, to be quick. RevitRocketShip.com. Check it out. Money back guaranteed. You also need to check out ArcGat.com. Why? Because as more business is and tenants demand green design in their building, lead certification is more important than ever. And while ArcCat is known for being red with their logos, they can help you go green. ArcCat provides thousands of lead reports from building product manufacturers on how their products can help you make the green choice that's right for your project. Head over to ArcCat.com and find the information you need for a lead. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com. I also want you to check out, of course, last but certainly not least, Pella Luxury. You have never experienced a brand like this before. The collection of brands within the luxury division of Pella are the conversation starters, the pioneers of industry who provide window and door solutions to discerning architects, the building industry, and beyond. They have decades of experience creating things no one else in the world is creating, and the collection of brands are brought together to complement and build on one another. They don't push beyond the limits. They set them. Explore PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm today. That's PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm today. Back to you, Mr. Gore. Lance, what do you got for us? Back to me. <laughs> I have a really interesting article that I heard on the Adam Carolla podcast this week. I highly encourage everybody to check out the Adam Carolla podcast. He is no sponsor or anything like that. But one of the best interviews I heard lately was uh, he had Mike Rowe on. Oh, it nice. Was, it was so good. It was so good. Uh, just down to earth kind of a discussion. Um, a lot about uh, that we, as, as we, as the world increases to be an ever more digital world, how important it is for uh, us as humans to not forget about all the tangible stuff, right? Sure. Uh, so part of that, that, that's kind of leading into this article. So uh, Dawson, one of his um, helpers on the podcast, had this article to read, and it was called, the title is, and Al, Al, Al's getting an electric car. I'm getting an electric car eventually. Mm-hmm. And it's titled, Is It Ethical to Purchase a Lithium Battery-Powered EV? Mm. So how, why this applies to architects, too, is uh, architects are, you know, very concerned with sustainability, right? Chances are you have an uh, environmental design degree. Like, you're, it's your job to understand how to design with and for the environment, built and natural, Right. So it's a short article here. It came out uh, about four days ago on June 13th. Uh, The author is Ronald Stein. So it goes on to say, with numerous state governors having issued executive orders to phase out the purchasing of gasoline-driven cars within the next decade or so, and automobile manufacturers' efforts to phase into only manufacturing EVs here, here's some food for thought about the lack of transparency about clean energy exploitations. Hmm. 
The typical oil well, where 100% organic material is pumped out of the ground, takes up around 500 to 1,000 square feet, then flows into pipelines, safely transporting the oil to refineries to be manufactured into usable oil derivatives that are at the basis of more than 6,000 products for society, Al. Nice. Wow. Chances are the shoes you're wearing are probably a derivative of that, like yes. the laptops, the microphones, all, all the things, right? In and into transportation fuels needed by the world's heavyweight and long-range infrastructures of aviation, merchant ships, cruise ships, and militaries. I don't know if you've ever built a building, Al. I have, actually. Really? Yes. <laughs> but it seems like you have to have some heavy equipment that run on what in order to do the jobs? Hopes and dreams. Hopes and dreams. I would call it diesel. Ah. <laughs> I got confused. Sorry. <laughs> But that's what it takes. Yeah. Uh, the so then the, the, then he goes on and say that there's an there's a there's an image in the articles. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. The lead image above is just one lithium supply mine, where entire mountains Whoa. are eliminated. Let me repeat that: entire mountains Whoa. are eliminated. And I don't know if you are following along with me and on this podcast, but I am into mountains. Yeah, you are. Uh, They're taking them away from you, Lance. They are, and the fish that go with them. Each mine usually consists of 35 to 40 humongous 797 Caterpillar haul trucks along with hundreds of other large equipment. Each 797 uses around half a million gallons of diesel a year. Not hopes and dreams, like I would. Mm. I was thinking we would build buildings with. So with an inventory of just 35 haul trucks alone are using 17.5 million gallons of fuel a year just for one lithium site. How much? 17.5 million gallons oh. of fuel a year for just one lithium site for your precious lithium ion batteries yes. in your future Tesla truck. Yeah. Or whatever it was, cyber truck. Uh, there is virtually non-existing transparency of the environmental degradation and the human rights abuses occurring in developing countries with yellow, brown, and black skin people. Both human rights abuses and environmental degradation are directly connected to the mining for the exotic materials and metals that are required to manufacture wind turbines, solar panels, and EV batteries. Today, a typical EV battery weighs 1,000 pounds. It contains 25 pounds of lithium, 60 pounds of nickel, 44 pounds of manganese, 30 pounds of cobalt, 200 pounds of copper, and 400 pounds of aluminum, steel, and plastic. Inside are over 6,000 thousand individual lithium ion cells it should concern you that all of these toxic components come from mining for instance to manufacture each ev auto battery you must process twenty-five thousand pounds of brine for the lithium thirty thousand pounds of ore for the cobalt five thousand pounds of ore for the nickel and twenty-five thousand pounds of ore for copper all told You dig up 500,000 pounds of the Earth's crust just for one battery. (laughs) 5,000. Last paragraph here. (laughs) That's a lot, man. Yeah, I don't think the last paragraph is... Go, Go ahead. Anything good? Yeah, it's just... Oh, okay. Well, anyway, so, yeah, let's... I won't even go there. You can read it if you want to. You just go to... Uh, just Google, like I said. I All I did was Google. All I did was search. It is... Is it ethical to purchase a lithium battery-powered EV? There's also really some interesting links he's got in there. So, the, the first paragraph cited mm-hmm. clean energy exploits. Um, it is a, uh, a book that was... Uh, I'm actually going to buy this on um, Kindle. Or not Kindle, but um, audiobooks. And uh, listen to it over the weekend. Uh, it's clean energy exploitations helping citizens understand the environmental and humanity abuse humanity abuses that support clean energy. So, if you, uh, what are your thoughts about all this, Al? Uh, first, I I believe, and I think it's true, that high fuel prices will cause more death than climate change. And I know that that might be. Uh, controversial or wow. a different thought, but quite the takes already. That's what I'm looking for the hot takes. One of the reasons why is his middle name is Hot Take Al Hot, hot Take or or Oracle, whatever you want, <laughs> whatever you want to say. Um, Pennsylvania farmers farmers literally don't have money to gas up their trucks to plow their fields. Now, what if oil prices oh, keep going up? Okay, ripple effects. Yeah, 
what if prices go up and they don't have the gas money to collect what's in their fields? Like that's food shortage, you know, and it's on top of food shortages coming from Ukraine, which Ukraine is a big area, bread, bread basket. Farmers you know. are not rich. I don't know if coastal listeners know that, but yep. they are not. So I grew I up on a farm. I am a fan of low uh, gas prices. And I think electric needs to compete to yeah. like that. That's what it is. Uh, overall, the, the one thing I would say about this is I think that this article is missing two things. Content, and it's what everyone's missing when they're narrowing in on a sure, point. Sure, tunnel vision. Yep. Context and perspective. Yeah. So context. So if you want to make something sound bad, you can, right? They said 100%. W- one thing, copper. So there's four times as much copper in your house than there is in a car. Like I, I looked it up. There is. So you could make the argument like what is like all the environmental damage that your house is going to, right? Yep. Well, you have to make houses and you have to make cars. So mm-hmm. you could do the same thing for houses, like how many trees you're killing, how much water those take up, how much uh, material it takes to go get the trees and not get the trees, yeah. the cement, the paint, right? Yeah. And then you can tell it's slightly slanted because it then says all these toxic components. Yeah. You just included aluminum, steel, and plastic, which is oil, which you just said oil in the beginning was an organic material. So it's like you're, you're literally saying yeah. two things out of, out of the side of your mouth. And here's what I go with, with the perspective, right? So that, that's the, like you're missing the context because what is this in context too? Because if you take that in context – to an ice vehicle or to a house, like, is this big or small? You know what I mean? Like you have to move so much earth. You have to transport so much stuff to make anything, right? Um, Perspective too. The one thing that I like about the potential of electric vehicles is not that it's electric, which is cool, because if you're just plugging into a coal power plant, what are you doing? But the ability, if you do it, the way that I want to do it, and, and probably you want to do it. More solar panels on the house. I told my wife, double solar panels. Is that where you're going? Yeah. So we have solar panels. Decentralized and competition to yeah. the energy industry. Yeah. Competition is what we and, talk and about. And localized all the time. too. So then, like, you, like, like literally, like 20 feet. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then the other thing, what that does when you have competition and local and decentralized, is that you're fighting the bureaucracies. And I want to fight yes. bureaucracies on every level. The corporate, corporate level, government. All of that. Yep. Institutional. Yep. You all suck. Bureaucrats, you suck. Yep. So then here's the, the perspective part is like, let's say electric vehicles are more environmental damaging than ice vehicles. Let's just take it at its face value and say, okay, and that's just, true. And, and just for talking points. Sure. Just for talking points. Yeah. Saying, but what does that allow us to do? Does it allow us to fight, to give competition to the energy industry and to fight bureaucracy? And, and also, we didn't even talk about, like, that gives you freedom from fluctuation prices. And also, like, if you have that, you might have freedom from the grid a little bit better. Oh, there's your perspective. Now, you know, there's your perspective. And then also have, like, the context. And, and this is why context matters so much. So did you hear Elon? He, he was talking to some group, right? And he said, in Texas, we built the whole factory. Have you seen this factory? It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. In 18 months. He goes, in California, it'd be two years before we got permitted. Oh, my gosh. And then you know what he said? And he goes, and you'd get sued. And he goes, you'd get sued just because you got sued. Would get sued in California because they made it so easy to get sued. Yeah. Harvest the insurance policies, right? Yeah. yeah. Slimy lawyers. So you know that he got sued in Germany. I did not know this. For that Remember, factory. Remember, you're a more insider, Elon, to me. And, so, and for the audience. So yep. l- let us know. Al Insider Gore. So as you know, we given we could even say that this whole article is true. I'm fine with that. The potential for in, uh, environmental friendliness of EV vehicles does have a potential if you do it a certain way. The environmentalists are who sued Elon in Germany. The environmentalists. Because they said you're chopping down trees. And they said paint shop is is toxic right well well again going back to the first one context do cars need paint every car needs paint besides the cyber truck besides the cyber truck <laughs> but but literally so are you saying like these are the way like lawyers get is like okay this one thing can be true that paint isn't the most environmental thing so i'm gonna sue your whole company and hold up everything because of this one truth and you have no context into 
If we're going to make cars, we're going to make paint. Can we agree to that? Oh, like literally, I just want to know where you're coming from. Yeah. Are we going to make cars? Okay, then you got to allow paint to happen. You just have to, right? Um, Or else, because someone else can make cars with paint. So what are you even doing here? You're just suing for what? You're just, and they would come up with a whole bunch of excuses and blah, blah, blah. It's nonsense. Shut your mouth. (laughs) Like... Have some context and perspective. The the, the point I liked uh, that you brought up the most, and the the only reason I was bringing in up up this article was I I just want people to think things logically all the way through, and consider consider things holistically, right? So th- so what I appreciated was when you brought up like, well, we could talk about the houses in the same kind of way. We could say right. like houses are you know toxic, steel, and all wood, concrete. It doesn't matter. Like there's there's impacts for everything. Okay. And it's just a weighing and a balance. But again, it's not this idea of one size fits all. Just think about the poor person who is just... Think about the poor landscape guy or gal who is driving, who has is having to drive a big truck every day to work. They're already... It's already tough for them to make things ends meet. Like, is this... If we are so concerned about, especially the poorest among us, and and not to mention even minorities, but to mention minorities, if if that's our... If that's where we're at, it's like... Then what... uh, Is asking them to just... Ah, just buy an electric car. Like, come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So... uh, Okay. Uh, Next thing I want to talk about was sales. So, Al and I have been... um, I, I, I was interested because I, I think I think one of our uh, favorite contractors, Brian Tinker, brought this up to you one day. Is that he was he sort of convinced you maybe or just helped plant a seed. You have to tell me if I'm wrong now, but that like it's okay to lose sixty percent of sales. Like you only want forty percent. And I can't remember if he said that to me or to you. Honestly. Okay. I thought he said it to you. I thought he said it to you. Mm. Uh, either way. So what I did is I look. So we've been uh, Al and I have been. Uh, Raising fees to the best of our ability, trying to understand where the market's at, where it's going, just like every business owner. Uh, sales are everything. Profit is your lifeblood, right? And so it's like, should you, what is the, uh, uh, and then once you get, once you become a seasoned owner or business person or entrepreneur, I really think there's a certain point where you're like, I don't, I'm comfortable losing this job. I'm, I'm, yes, I still want this job. But like getting really comfortable with trying to command higher fees and better projects, better clients, yeah. and then getting comfortable with losing out more. So I've got an article pulled up from, uh, it's called RainSalesTraining.com, and the title is Average, Artic- it's Average Sales Rates. How do you compare most seller? And so uh, I just want to go over some quick things briefly. Uh, I've got he's got a chart, and basically all he says all across all respondents, the average win rate is forty seven percent, meaning right. you meaning you will, you will get forty seven percent of sales. So without going into all the details and everything, I just think that like okay, if 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 a seasoned uh, general contractor veteran uh, has. It, told me and Al who is and this guy has you know a decade more of experience than us and he's been doing it right for you know the luck decade longer or whatever if then another person is saying yeah it's okay to lose more than 50 percent of your the, the business you go after yeah um I just wanted to like I'm have I'm it, for me it's been an epiphany this last year of it's okay to weed out through higher fees and being comfortable losing more I, I agree with that um, because also, too, if your win rate is higher but your price is lower, I saw this in the lumber industry like um, because we knew people in the lumber in- industry and it was, yeah, the, the salesman keeps getting sales and like gets great commission. But like now we have now we are pressured to execute on that low margin. Mm. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, yeah, you got to leave. There's got to be meat on the bone for incentive. Yeah. Right? I think that's the best way. So if you're out there and you feel like you need to win every sale, please don't. Uh, Please don't feel like you're obligated to. And understand that we are telling you, uh, people are telling us, multiple people, and then the research shows that, like, the, the, the best kind of sale is probably a balance between not winning all of them and trying to command the highest fees possible with the best quality clients. Pretty obvious once you state it, but... There you go. Uh, Al, the Oracle Gore, 
predicted mm-hmm. the latest Federal uh, Reserve rate hike, which was 0.75 percent, 75 points. Yep. Congratulations on that. So, with rising interest rates, higher construction costs are going to slow housing production, according to NAHB, mm-hmm. which drastically affects uh, every, uh, most people who are listening to this podcast business, especially if you're doing um, housing, but also commercial goes into this too, because everybody's getting loans to build buildings, right? Not a lot of people just purely build them with cash. Um, so, I wanted to see, you know, what is it, what is any, what does the National Association of Home Builders have to say um, in regards to like what does this mean for everything, right? So, the May reading of 1.55 million starts is the number of housing units builders would begin if development kept this pace for the next 12 months. With this overall number, single family starts decreased 9.2% to a 1.05 million seasonally adjusted and annual rate. The multifamily sector, which includes apartment buildings and condos, decreased 23.7% to an annualized. That's kind of a giant drop, right? Yeah. Technically, you could say, so a uh, crash is defined as anything over 20% difference. That would mean that multifamily technically cr- is crashing year mm. over year. Just saying. Yep. Uh, single family looks like it's correcting. Um, so, uh, and then in some further signs that the housing marketing is weakening, single family permits are down 2.5% on a year to date basis and home builder confidence has declined for the last six months due to the acceleration in construction activity in recent quarters, housing completions are rising. Single family completions were up 8.5% in May, 2022 compared to May, 2021 as inventories rise. Uh, so, um, what I think this means overall is, again, it still points to this big supply crunch that is happening. And my wife and actually Jason Bus upstairs was even talking about this. I hadn't heard this. I hadn't heard people doing this for a while, but it was so weird how coincidental it was. In the morning, Jason was like, I don't know if he has a friend who's a lender or, or something like that, but he was, he, he was like, oh, yeah. I got my, my friend was telling me for the first time since 2008, they have had somebody come in and say, what do you think about an adjustable rate mortgage? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I know. I'm scared. Yeah, I know. And but let me let me let me just talk uh, this through with you. Talk me into I, it. Because like he's just like a scared little puppy dog over here. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hit me. <laughs> uh, I'm a good dog. Yeah, I got you in 2008. Yeah, I got really smacked hard, 2008. Uh, and then my wife, so I'd, I'd I'd lunch with my wife yesterday, and same thing came up. She goes, I'm actually having to. So she's also a mortgage broker now, and so she said I, she's like, she's going to have to educate herself and and get like up to speed on how to explain and demystify what and p- try to not scare folks about it's okay to maybe do adjustable rate mortgages. And I know you're just like, everybody's listening going uh, inside. So the idea is, <laughs> the idea is, here's the idea. People are, so so the, the system, AKA the Federal Reserve and like the whole game system, yeah. since they push up the interest rates again, which they have to do to try to fight inflation that they created, right? So like, anyway, so, <laughs> so they have pushed mortgage rates to over 6% now. Yes. And the last time they pushed interest rates over 6% was in 2000, 2008, and we had the Great Recession, right? Yeah. The difference between, between two, the biggest, one of the biggest differences between 2008 and 2022 right now, and in the housing market as it pertains to lending is, in 2008, there, like 40% of the loans were adjustable mortgages at a certain point, okay? Yeah. Now it's less than 1%. But now we're starting to hear rumors of people trying to beat the system okay that yeah. has been created of trying to get a lower interest rate and you can do that through an adjustable rate mortgage so you can get an adjustable rate mortgage for subprime lending meaning like you can get it to like like four percent maybe three mm-hmm. percent somewhere in there like you can get it down to where oh now all of a sudden that big jumbo loan for nine hundred thousand dollars for a new house in boulder county I can afford it at the 4% rate, adjustable rate mortgage. I can't afford it at 6%. I'm going to take my chances. 
<laughs> because the adjustable rate will last for what three years exactly five years? exactly I, I some period of time that will allow them to time it in theory thinking that like well the fed because what the fed is saying now is they're gonna raise interest rates probably one more time next month right half a point three quarters of a point <clears throat> and then they're gonna just let it ride to flatten out inflation and start dropping them again in 2024 that's the word on the street. So if you believe all that as gospel, then it's like, oh yeah, why wouldn't I go with an adjustable rate mortgage, ride it out for a couple years. When they drop rates again, I will just make sure that I refinance and get a, and turn it into a fixed rate mortgage and I'll be all gravy. Yes. I, I'm trying to see what, what is the Fed base now up to after they hike that? Because, I mean, they were at zero. I want to know where it's at. So uh, it was a half a point. It should be one and a quarter. Oh, it's a one at a quarter? Yeah. So they're going to go more than that. Yeah. I, I was listening. I was like, I might as well listen to this guy. Whatever his name. Drone Powell or... Yeah. Yep. The Federal Reserve Chairman. Yeah. They want to get it up to normal, which is between 3 and 4%. Yeah. So if they're at, what did you say? 1.25. 1. 1. 1.25? Yeah. So, Lance, hey, they're going to... They got double. They got to double that. Yeah. And really, if they were so, really serious about tamping down inflation, they would be at like 10%. Like, yeah. honestly, because you have, to, you have to beat the level of inflation yep. to tamp it down. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, but and if I, they do that, they're going to cause a Great Depression. So they have to be really careful. Yes. They have to balance it. Who knows if they will. One thing I was looking at, too, was uh, s supply and demand of lumber so lumber is currently at you looking at futures yep, yep. it's uh it's went down just 538 oh it's way better and that's going back there you go i've got it pulled up that's on the exactly screen exactly the same thing but lance go to the max please oh the max okay i went to yep. the oh wow look at these charts looks like so, Bitcoin. so we'll see where we're back that that other peak way back there is 2008 go back right here yep yeah. 2000. Oh, that's 2018. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, these, it, it, I mean, it's coming back down. Who knows? Like we've seen some roller coasters there. So basically what he's pointing at is uh, in 2018, yeah. it was at $609. So I think it's a board foot. And then now it's, it's, it's something different. 569. Yeah. So we're, it's better. I, and I'm seeing it as a contractor on the, on the ground. Yep. I, like the, we, I put together a quote for a deck, I don't know, two months ago. And then the ladies came back and they're like, okay, we want to start next week. And I go, okay, let me look at, let me redo the quote. And they came down by a couple hundred bucks. It's not bad. Yep. We actually have a project that came, uh, within budget. So, you know, I, everybody knows that I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I know it's funny to say, but like it's been staying in budget. It's amazing. Yep. And it hasn't died. So like, I know people like Peter Schiff, who I'm a big fan of, but at the same time, like the one thing I disagree with, that I think he's completely wrong about the real estate market is like, he's claiming that like, oh, nobody's gonna be able to afford to build homes uh, because of all the increased costs of everything. Well, Peter, they're going down. I'm just here to tell you, like it, we are like, if anything, I just want steady growth. Like we don't need this hyperinflated, ramped up economy. Yep. And, and somehow in 89, it, my parents bought two houses before their cabin. Uh, I can't, it, the 80, the ones that they bought in the eighties, they, they had it at 19%. And the then interest they, rates? Yes. Then they had to refinance when it came down. So crazy. Mom was stoked at 12%. <laughs> and then I'm sure they refinanced again. Isn't perspective again just like almost everything? Yeah. Every time. Yep. So that's another way that, you know. Yeah, who knows how the, the the timing is interesting with trying to do with the arm. It makes sense too, especially like even a couple of years ago. I thought to myself, why would people anyone do arms? Well, there's investors who know that they're gonna just hold it for three to four years and then sell it. Yeah, you know, same thing as my wife was saying that. Yep, yep. yep. But then if you time, if you did that, let's just say, uh, what would be, well, yeah, if you had to somehow sell it in that month or two when COVID really happened, then you could have been screwed. <laughs> right. 
Right, right, right. Timing is hard. Okay, last last big topic to talk about today is the battle between speed and, and quality. And this mostly pertains to um, our construction side of everything. Uh, so this is a battle that happens all the time in our industry. So I've got a I've got an article pulled up here from LinkedIn. The battle between speed and quality. Uh, it's a couple years old actually, but it, it's still very relevant. There was a couple of things. Uh, the the big conclusion for me was, and we actually have a meeting later today with one of our employees to kind of talk about this with and a strategy. And so uh, basically, what it boils down to, if you read through this article, is that like the more efficient you are the better that the quality will come out. So it's, it's sort of that it's that simple. And it, so it's not, you don't have to sacrifice anything. We don't have to sacrifice speed for quality. If we have an efficient way of working and a working method, and if we're also confident in what we're doing, that was, that was some of the big takeaways. So there's something to be said uh, for working fast, how quickly a job is done can significantly affect how it can be achieved in a day, a week, a month, and a year. Even small increase in speed can all uh, add up, right? Um, so what you want to do is, so in today's workplaces, working faster is really uh, all about doing work in the most efficient way possible. This includes minimizing or eliminating interruptions from text messages, instant messages, social media. Um, and this is the big one. It, in, it also includes creating a physical workplace that eliminates waste of motion. For example, if an employee has to visit the supply room or if they have to go off the job site to go get materials, right, or a tool, especially if it's like a two-man crew, think about it this way. Here's how what I, what I boiled it down to. It seems like there's this in-between. It's sort of, if it's a one-man crew, well, he ha almost has no choice to go get the materials himself if there's nobody else available to do it. Is he wasting time? Not really because there's not... If it's not like there's a two-man crew there. One guy went to go get the stuff. The other guy's just twiddling his thumbs. You know what I mean? So, so the goal then is to, is, to, is to increase the speed at which work is done in strategic ways, right? So what I put together then, um, and I'll pull it up here real quick, is I put together, you can see it on the screen, a couple of examples of drywall crew, crew example of the most efficient crew model. And I, and I cited, like, who should be doing what? There's a cut man. Al loves this term. Cut man. Mm -hmm. Cut man, for example. Tasks are staying ahead of screw men. Cutting drywall. Temporarily setting drywall in place ahead of screw man. No one is ever waiting on the cut man. Cut man's always ahead of everybody. Yep. He's got caprices cut ahead of everybody. He's thinking ahead, right? Screw men. Tasks are hanging pre-cut drywall sheets by cut men and screwing them off. Screw men hang all available to hang sheets by cut men until there are none to hang. When initial initial hanging sheets are pinned with only a few screws to hold them up, there are none to hang. Then they screw the drywalls off completely until there are no more to hang. Like, but either way, you're constantly going. And then, if you're done with all that, you're done screwing off, great. Keep the f site free of debris while you're waiting on the cut man. Pick mm -hmm. up all the scraps, throw them away. Like, pick up around the cut man. Yep. At all times, there's no wasted motion. Yep. That's, that's the goal. Yep. So I have a... Uh one example too and i don't know if the crew does this or not M maybe you'll know so when i was i was doing the last task at my house i was building a custom closet solution and then also installing pre-made things and you know how things come up like oh need drywall anchors oh need another piece of this and every time i came to something i needed it was oh you just literally write that down on the list yes and what else can you do because then by the time you do those four smart, other, four, smart. you know, and you, then there, you didn't waste the motion at all. It went there once instead of four times. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, that's, that's a big one. I think this is one. the kind of the crux. Uh, hmm. okay. Uh, on with that, we've got our last little segment here. Second to last little segment here. Nick is back. Wow. With the Top Gun read. If you haven't checked out Top Gun, I highly recommend watching Top Gun this weekend. The new one. Exciting. Hello, best friends. I hope you all had a great week this week. Two quotes. Remember, boys, no points for second place. Slider from Top Gun. I finished second. Just want to manage expectations. 
Maverick from Top Gun Maverick. Toodles. No points for second place. No points. No points for second place at all. Speaking of placement, what do you got next now? Well, ARE Jeopardy. Those that get second place don't get to choose where we get to eat. There you go. Let's bring them down. Question number one. Who is responsible for keeping official records of application received for permit, fees collections, and reports of inspections? Is it A, the architect of record, B, the contractor, C, the building official, or D, the applicant? Who is responsible for keeping official records of applications received for permits, the fees collected, and reports of inspections? A, architect. B, contractor. I should have made C, contractor, so it matched the letters, but what are you going to do? <laughs> and then B, the building official. Man, I really screwed this up. I could have A, B, C, that. that. Or D, the applicant. Right? You both are wrong. The building official. So if, the, if anything's lost, that's on you, building official. It's on you. Also keep good records yourself. Uh, question two. In a flood plain, how many square inches... Per square foot of enclosed area should flood openings be in a crawl space? Is it A, one inch, B, two inch, C, three inch, D, four inch? So for every square foot you have in a crawl space, if it's in a floodplain, how many square inches of uh, vents should you have for flood vents? Perfect. One one inch and two inch, it is a one inch. One inch per foot. Easy to remember. Number three, as it pertains to common electrical abbreviations, what does C slash B stand for? Is it A, common breaker? Is it B, circuit breaker? Is it C, critical breaker? Or is it, a, or is it D, circuitry below? We got B. B. Correct answer is B. What do we got for scores? One. Two. Okay, Jason's in the lead. Number four, as it pertains to common electrical abbreviations, what does GND stand for? GND. Is it grand new dimension, A? Mm. Is it B, uh, ground? Is it C, going north direction? Or is it D, gang neutral dimensions? What do we got? B. B. Correct answer is B. Jason wins. Woo. That's it. That's it. Jason, where are we going to eat? Long's Pizza. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you win. There we go. You win. Uh, if you like this episode, please uh, leave us a comment on the YouTube. Like, subscribe. If you're listening terrestrially on any of the platforms, iTunes, Spotify, etc., please leave us a five-star review. We will see you next week, and we will see everybody who's coming to the AIA. High fives, free high fives, free fist bumps, free finger guns, and uh, we'll see you there.